Gareth Jennings, welcome to the podcast. Like I do with every guest that I have, Gareth, I look at the beginning of their journey. How did sport become a passion for you at a young age? Um, I think my mum and dad taking me to watch Derby County as a young, uh, as a you know a, a young person, and um, you know at the baseball ground, and you're so close into the game, and you get drawn into the atmosphere and the emotion of uh, of football, um, and just felt connected straight away. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it, it's sort of ran through my family. Um, you know, my dad played, and my grandfather's played, and um, so yeah, I think I just naturally got that connection with the game. Uh, and I've grown up with two two brothers who are both huge fanatical fans as well um love the game and um, so sort of yeah I, I grew up in a household where you know football was uh um was probably our religion and when was that moment for you when you thought about having a career within the game and obviously having a, an opportunity to maybe make a living out of football when, when was that moment can you can you remember yeah probably um I, I was I was sort of going into a number of clubs when I was a young a young player um and uh was 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 quite fortunate. Had opportunities to go into in, into clubs, and um, I, I wasn't I wasn't that great at, at anything else, to be honest. Um, wasn't academically strong. Um, uh, well, didn't feel I was academically strong at at, at the time, probably because my full focus was on on on, on the football. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think I could see anything else. Probably very similar to a lot of young players that come through now, although we're. We're obviously trying to really sort of take those blinkers off and sort of go, right, well, if you open up your mind a little bit, it'll probably really contribute to you being a professional footballer and you know things like school and the contribution that education makes. I was very blinkered. I was, um, you know, I, I loved the game. I couldn't think about anything else. Um, so yeah, probably like uh, a lot of young people, that's exactly where I wanted to go and I wanted to be, I, I wanted to be a player. And was there anyone at that stage that mentored you or guided you to to, to have that aspiration of being a, a football player? Was there anyone that stands out on reflection of that time where you thought that advice really helped me there or that support helped me to to maybe get through a certain period? Yeah, I think um, well, hundred percent. Like my parents, um, you know, um, my dad and um, my grandfather, um, you know, were passionate about the game and loved the game, and they would always hugely encouraged me and you know mum and dad came to every game and, and even my two brothers you know so sort of when I reflect on it now they got dragged here there and everywhere because I was you know I got uh, games that I was playing in and um so and 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 everyone was really encouraging and I think I was I was really lucky as well so in terms of I think the group of friends that I had as a as a young person um I think they knew that you know I wanted to be a footballer and they were they almost sort of bought into it as well that okay well you know, Gareth won't come out drinking with us, and uh, you know he's got a commitment to wanting to be a player. And, and yeah, I think I was really fortunate, like with school friends and people that I knew socially, you know, where I lived, that um, they were they were really supportive as well. And just on that, then, so obviously discipline is a key aspiration or a key element of uh, your your journey in terms of that experience you shared. But is there anything that stands out in terms of lessons learned from your playing career that's maybe informed your current roles or your roles? After football, I'm just intrigued on if there's anything that you think is transferable into maybe some of the the things that you've you've got to got up to more recently. Is there anything that you've learned during that period? Yeah, I think, and probably one that comes out quite that's quite common at the moment when you talk to you know when you talk to players is that having some resilience. There was definitely a point where you know I was I wasn't going to be a footballer uh, or that wasn't going to be my full time career, and you've got to cope with that. Um, you know, a, a lot of the relationships that you've got are built around you. You're you're a professional footballer, and you know, you, even your parents. You, I mean, they're they're friends with other parents at the at the academy, and you know, there's you know, when I did my scholarship, you're with other people in digs, and my parents are friends with theirs, and siblings are friends, and so you know, when you leave a football club, it's not just about you not having a career in the game actually you're thinking about other people that it affects as well um and obviously the reality of then i've got i've got to find something else i've got i've got to do something else so one having that resilience but also i think having a a sort of mindset of okay well what does success look like for me now so how do i find a way to get a career in the game if it's not going to be the number one thing that i set out for it to 
set out for it to be. So I think I think those things help you really cope in your career. Um, and I I always say, you know, when I think, you know, if you become a professional football, so when I got my first professional contract, um, you go into that professional phase, you've been a scholar and, and probably all the way through, you've been in that sort of top tier of, of players. So, you know, you, you know that, you know, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm quite good at this game. So you get this sort of level of success and you go through it. And then you become a professional player. And for most players going into that professional phase, then you're not. You're actually in the bottom tier. You're, in your, you're with the best of the last 10 years that have, have, have got through that program. So actually being able to cope with that and, um, and, and, and trying to challenge that and trying to work your way up through the group. I think it builds some builds some good character, um, but I think also that sort of um, that team mentality um, and getting on with people. So I, th- I think when you come through as a young player, you, you do start to recognise that players are going to get released or someone might get injured, and they, you know these are your friends, the the people that you're close to, um, and probably being empathetic towards that and. Um, understanding some of the challenges that they face. I think some of those things certainly come back to support you through your career um, with, with, without a doubt. Um, I, I, look, I was fortunate enough to have that as a as a pathway and I think it was a nice sort of starting point, although I, I, I didn't get another professional contract after the very first one. I think, um, you know, you do you do recognise that, that that pathway that you've had and how fortunate you've been to have it. It, it does help you. Now, I don't know what a normal career pathway looks like because obviously I didn't have that. But I did go back to college then and have to try and get a job and, and work my way up. Um, but so, yes, I, I certainly think it does it, it does help. And that transition from obviously playing football and everything that you're inspiring to be and obviously your identities are wrapped around football and you mentioned then that transition to college and going back and finding out what you want to do. How was that for you? And, and were you motivated to, to maybe prove a point because you were coming out of this transition or you mentioned obviously you didn't get a contract as well. What was your incentive to, to maybe learn and educate yourself around that time? But I think for about 20 years, you're still convinced that you're going to, you're going to get another professional contract somewhere. You know, I, I never lost that until I was probably about in, in my thirties that you're thinking, oh, I can still break through. I've got, a, I'm, I'm now playing non-league football and I'll get an opportunity at some point. Um, but I, I think there is a realization that, you know, you want to, you want to be successful in life um, and yes, it's difficult, but I think you do find other passions as well. Things that sort of um, sort of spark you, make you want to progress. And I, I like, I never, never wanted to come out of the game. The, you know, and I, and I, I tried lots of different careers, lots of different things that I was sort of like going off, oh, right, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go and do that because it'll, you know, I, I can, I can get some additional money on top of the money that I'm getting from from uh, playing non-league. Um, so I'm going to do a part-time job and try try different things. But I think I never lost that mentality of I wanted to be full-time in the game again um, at, at, at some point. Um, and, and I certainly had a I had a passion for coaching when I first started out on the journey. Um, I loved I loved developing other other people, um, and it it was certainly a a spark and I and I, I loved being around football as well. Um so I think when I talk to former players or people that have gone into other careers, the bit that they probably miss the most is just being around the um the organization and uh that, that camaraderie of the team and the actual environment that's created within uh well within a club or within any sort of football context. Um I think that's the bit that you really miss. And in terms of obviously those experiences, you mentioned coaching and, and we'll lead on to maybe more of a, your, your role around technical directorship, et cetera. But what, what is your learning process there then, Gareth? Are you, are you being self-aware? Are you looking at other people within the, the environment that you're in and you're trying to learn off them or you're learning le- leadership traits from other people that you might have inspired to, to work with? H- how do you learn those transferable skills going into an environment where you want to inspire, you want to coach, you want to lead people. I'm just interested in how you de- and how you develop those skills as a whole. Yeah, I I do remember sort of um you know watching watching other people learn uh, or watching other people deliver um coaching sessions and almost being in awe of them, going wow that's like unbelievable or 
or it comes to the end of the session and I, I, it was almost like you were in a daze. You'd sort of watched it and you were, you were sort of in the moment listening to the coach and what they were talking about or what they were, um, you know, watching how they were delivering something. And I'd have to sort of like to think back, right, what, what did they do? Like what were the, the things that they actually did? And um, cause I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, when I was at school, I wasn't an effective learner. Like I found school a, a, a real challenge. It was quite, quite difficult. Um, loved it from a social perspective, but like didn't, you know, from a learning perspective, I thought I was, I, I was really poor. Um, so I had to find ways to, to learn. And I, I, I loved just almost being quiet and observing and, um, and watching people and then sort of going through it in my own, own time and thinking, right, well, what did they do that was really good then? And how did they engage people? Um, what was the message that they were trying to get over? How did that transfer of knowledge take place? Um, probably more of that actually than the 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 real sort of technical detail I, I i was interested in the knowledge transfer piece um which probably why i've never been a top level coach to be honest you know i think you need that technical you need all of the, the the facets to it um but um yeah it, it certainly sort of sparked me probably as a learner um in terms of right okay i i've got a sort of thirst for more at that at that stage and is obviously reflection important to you then within that process? Because you mentioned your uh, need to want to coach and develop people and then recognizing, well, technicality is something that I'm limited to. So maybe I can transfer my traits into other areas. And obviously in the positions you're in now, more of a senior management, sorting out maybe other aspects of football in comparison to maybe on the pitch. You, is that something that you identified a route to go down or is it something that maybe come naturally to you i'm just interested on your decision making there to, to go down that route yeah i think um i i think i always knew that i wanted to sort of grow and develop people and i think as you go through your career you start to realize right how important that skill set is and so it doesn't matter whether I'm, I'm i'm coaching in a community program or i'm working as head of technical leadership at fifa um and then recognizing who the people that you affect are. So, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a coach working at, in, a, in a club's community scheme, okay, well, I'm the people that are affecting the young people in front of me. Um, so when I was at FIFA and I've got I've got my team of staff, okay, well, well I know that they're going to probably go and work with technical leaders that are in member associations. Those technical leaders in the member associations will work with senior technical staff at the, at, at the clubs or in national association level. So then you're starting to affect. So you're a sort of few tiers up, but the team in front of me, right, I need to affect these. And how do I grow these these people? And what does that look like? And it doesn't really look any different to delivering a training session on a, on, on the grass. It's really understanding the individual and what their needs are, um, identifying where there's potential in an individual and how you can grow some of their key skill sets. What are the gaps that they've got in their development that will really support them to... Um, fulfill their potential and become really competent in the future um i that's i don't think that's any different from a coach and yeah so i think i recognize that okay i could be quite good at this um and there might be other roles within football that i'd be better suited to than actually going out and delivering on the grass in a full-time capacity although i I do love that (laughs) so so for those so just on that then gareth so for those that are listening or watching to this pod watching this podcast they might think about what the actual role of a technical director or a technical leader is. Have you experienced, you mentioned Stoke, FIFA, um, Wales, as well as Groomsby Town. Can you maybe define the role and what what, what a, a week looks like within a position within <laughs> this, this kind of area? I'm just interested on that. Yeah, so I, I suppose one of the sort of big challenges that we've got, um, so if you look at the role of, say, the sporting director, um, you know, the, the role's not... Although for a number of us at the Association of Sporting Directors, the role is quite defined and we, we know what that looks like. But in the club world, it can look different in every club because they've all got a different different environment, a different context. They've got different challenges. They're all at a different development level. Um, so they're, so it's quite, it's quite different across the board. So if we look at the different types of roles that I've got, so as technical director in the UAE Pro League, actually I'm working with all of the professional clubs, um, we're looking at, okay, what do player transfers look like in the UAE? Um, now, when I'm looking at that, 
Um, although there's some, some huge similarities, there's some different challenges that exist. So we, we really want to introduce some real clear structures around how you recruit players because we want to add value to the league. Um, we want to make sure that performances improve. Um, and being able to do that, we probably need a level of control centrally at the league um, to be able to support some of the decision-making processes because we don't have what I would class as the right structures in place. Um, we're heading in the right direction, um, but it's probably going to be over a number of years. Whereas then you take my role at, um, at Grimsby Town as a non-executive director for specifically for the football context. Um, I'm very much advising the owners and the CEO around some of the decisions that we will make in the club, um, supporting the head coach um, in terms of some of the challenges that they may face, um, probably reminded them reminding them of things like, right, well, what does your development look like? Because their focus is very much on the team and winning the game. So those roles will look completely different. And then the technical advisory board at the FAW, um, you know, we've got a really sort of competent uh, board of, 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 of people um, that have been at the top level of the game. And for that, we'll review, we'll review the World Cup. Um, we'll look at... Uh, talent identification, what the squad selection look like, um, how do we grow the the women's academies in 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 Wales to make sure that we've got a sustainable uh, playing workforce coming through in the FAW. So that it, it's really really varied uh, across the board. What I would say is there's some some core skills in there, certainly around um, around leadership and understanding what what leadership looks like. Um, and the the bit that's really difficult around that is you've got to be you've got to be quite agile. It looks different in different spaces. Um, so when I go in and lead a project um, in, in in the Middle East, for example, um, I have to be really aware of the cultural norms in the Middle East and some of the challenges around that um, to be effective in my role. Whereas actually, if I go into a if I go to a club in England. Um, they'll probably want me to really, really lead on a project and actually really drive it and be at the forefront of that. And you'll have complete autonomy in that role to be able to lead on it. Um, that's that's definitely different here. So I think globally, roles can look different. But even from club to club in, 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 in the UK, uh, the role can look quite different. But the core theme is, though, some of those, those leadership strengths um, that I, I think, I think you, the, that you need to have. Just on that then, so... A lot to dissect in terms of what you said. I'm interested on in what you think maybe the hardest part of working in football is. And you mentioned a few facets then. You mentioned different key performance indicators depending on the club and the environment that you're working in. What do you think the most challenging part is? Because, you know, from your perspective, you mentioned the word autonomy. You're giving trust. You're giving information to owners or informing people. Is that hard in terms of convincing people or, or is it? Is it is it easy for you? Is it natural for you? I'm just interested in what you think. And again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm interested in what you think, what the the hardest part of working in the game is from a technical director's perspective is. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah probably really difficult. I think that the hardest part, so if I look at my role at, um, at, at FIFA, for example, where we're going into, so um, there's 211 member associations globally. Um, so uh, football associations that you go into, um, actually bring into life a strategic plan. So most clubs, leagues, um, and, and and member associations will have a strategy around how they work and how all the high performance pieces fit together. But actually bringing that to life and making it work, um, and 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 being really true to those values. Sometimes you have to be really brave with that. You know, you, you have to uh, you have to make some difficult decisions that that may upset certain people. Um, you need to make sure that everyone's on board um, and they're they're pulling in the same direction. I think that those things, in terms of bringing it to life, are really really difficult. There was a there was um, uh, an article I saw earlier today, and it was about um, it was a, about a player that Brighton were signing and. The bit that is really impressive about so someone had spoken around like you know a great piece of recruitment and it was it was really smart they were signing a player from 
Argentina and, you know, Argentina is quite interested at the moment because the economy is, is, is going downhill quite, quite rapidly. So it's, it's a great recruitment environment because actually they've got a culture of developing good quality young players. Um, but actually you can, you, but they now need money. So actually it's a buyer's market. You can, you can go there. Um, now, although they're really smart around recruitment, Brighton, that can't be in isolation. They've got to, they've got to make sure they're bringing in a young player that's 19. Um, I think it's costing them around about 7 million. Now, yes, it's a great bit of business from a transfer perspective, but there's also got to be trust then in what does the development and care of that young player look like coming into your club? And it's not just about the first team manager. It's about how all of the people and all of the pieces fit together to make sure that we get an outcome from that. So this player can either really contribute to our first team and be impactful there, or we can sell that player so our club becomes really sustainable in in the top flight of English football. Now, what's really good about, about Brighton and impressive about Brighton is they've got a strategic plan and it's lived. And... They don't have to tell anyone that story. We can all see it. We all know that that's what it does. Um, so I'm sure when they're signing a player, there's not really too much convincing. Um, the, the story tells itself. You go to Brighton, you'll get opportunities. Um, you know that there'll be a development pathway pathway for you. Um, so I think being able to put all of those pieces together and live your strategy is probably the most difficult part. I, I think you always hear about it when you've got sort of big clubs and people think it's falling apart people just go don't seem like they've got any plan or a strategy to what they're actually doing and they've signed this player from there and then this member of staff's come in and he's left and 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 they're probably right that's <laughs> you've probably gone off plan which is really re- really difficult now sometimes you might have to steer your strategy in different directions and be um you know have, have some sort of flexibility to you uh, and be agile in as a leader, um, but being able to bring it to life is is, is such a hard hard task, um, and and it, it's I always find it interesting. You go into a lot of a lot of clubs, um, and or or any type of football organisation. You'll go in, and a lot of the time, the, the the strategy or the plan is in the drawer, and no one's aware of it or knows about it, or there's not been an onboarding process that which would really help someone's job. Um, when you when you go in and you know, right, this is the role that I do and this is the contribution that I make because this is what we're trying to achieve. Like that, for someone going into a role, that's brilliant. Okay, that's really good. Now, they probably have an onboarding process in terms of, right, this is your desk. This is where you sit. There's the printer. Um, this is where the coaching department is. This is where sports science. But actually, the bit that sort of brings your job to life is where do you fit in that overall strategy of your of your club? Um, so that's, I think that's a, a, a real challenge. And, and also that just, just be really being true to your values. You'll get tested all the time in football. Um, and we all know right and wrong and being able to stay on that right side all of the time. I know tests people without a doubt. Um, so actually going, right, this is the right decision. This is the right thing to do. Um, although, um, it, it may be. It may be costly in other aspects, but doing the right thing, I think, is really, really important because reputational value to an individual, um, I think, it is highly, highly valued. What What are you like in that process? Obviously, you mentioned the, the example of Brighton, Gareth, but obviously risk and reward. You can only control the controllables. There's so many variables in a transfer deal. You mentioned differences in terms of culturally adapting to styles of play, adapting to people. What's it like for you as a technical director when, when kind of you, you're drawing or you're recruiting or you're giving ideas and it takes time to mould or there's a there's a period where you need to see it fruition, but obviously football's fast paced and yeah. they want instant results, the owners and the fans, etc. What, what's that like for you? I am the best at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think um, I look. I think I think I've become sort of like more thoughtful over time. Um, and we'll take a little bit of a step back now and try and sort of see that bigger, that bigger picture. Um, and I think if you if you do that, you'll realise why certain decisions are made at, at clubs or a board wants to make a, a certain decision. Um, so I think that I think I've become more of a sort of systemic thinker 
um, over the last probably five to ten years than than I was initially. Um, I, I was certainly probably um, more emotional when I first sort of started out in a leadership capacity. Um, whereas I think now I'm 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 a lot more thoughtful about things and try to understand it, you know, through through someone else's lens and why decisions been made. Um, um, you know, why finance has been turned down for a specific player or they want to go in a different direction to um, what what your thoughts are. Um, I think I'm getting that broader that broader context now, um, and um, I, I will take time to think about decisions now. It's it's really difficult in a club environment because usually decisions again they need to be made because you've got a game on Saturday, um, so um, you can get really really pressurised. Um, so it's being able to have that, um, what's the word that that sort of discipline to go right, just take your time, take a step back, have a look at the situation. Um, we need to make um, as near to the best decision as possible. Um, so we do the right thing. Okay, well, I, I need to have some really clear thoughts around that. If you go into that sort of that stress mode and <laughs> start making rush decisions, um, yeah, I, I think being able to have that um, that skill set of being able to do that, I think it's really really important. And, I, and look, I've had some some good people around me, and I've I've been fortunate with the jobs that I've had in terms of some of the leaders that I've been able to work with. That um, I, I wouldn't say they've been mentors but certainly people that have guided me and I've been able to go back and ask questions and um and and, and sometimes as well just looking back where at the time I've probably think they were a real pain to work with that was that was tough going and um it's difficult when I look back now and I think do you know what they were a really good leader some of the things that they did some of the decisions they made I can see why they did that um so uh, yeah I think and I think being mindful of that as well okay you've you've got to keep developing and growing so start to recognize where um, there's been some key influences in, in your own development. Would you plan then in regards to maybe what you've just said uh, in terms of going into a football club or working with FIFA or even in the UAE at the moment around maybe different circumstances that might happen? So for example, if, if a team was kind of struggling at the bottom end of the table and January came, you had to maybe come up with a strategy to recruit players or manager leaves or players get injured do you kind of um hypothetically come up with solutions that might happen in in the future or i'm just interested on how you plan and prepare for for unexpected things within football and also how you plan for maybe two years three years four years five years to have maybe longevity in a in a certain league and and, and have and to have growth i'm interested on how you work but yeah so i think obviously as you uh, as, as you as you progress through the uh, through your career you start to um recognize pictures that reoccur and you go right this is the decision i made then was it right or actually have i reflected on it and made a different decision so you certainly have that where you can probably make some quicker decisions because you've had that uh instance or circumstance happen previously um but yeah certainly i think you know i'll go through reflective processes um in terms of what i do on a weekly basis what i've done during a particular year um i you know i will think about decisions that I've made during the day um, and potentially discuss them with, with, with certain people. You know, I'll, I'll still discuss things with my parents and my brothers and my wife works in football, so I'll, I'll have a discussion with her about what's taken place and um, and, and you get sort of key people that'll, that'll really help you. And I, look, I've, got a, I've, I've got some really good good friends in the game now as well. Um, so, you know, you know, the Association of Sporting Directors have been really good for me in terms of the, the, the network of people there that are helpful and supporting. Um, and, you know, if you've made a certain decision, you, you might just think, oh, do you know what? I know this person will have come up against this before. I'll, I'll have a conversation with them. Um, or it might be a head coach. You know, you might have made a decision for a head coach or um, question them or challenge them on something. Um, and you might go, oh, okay, I'll speak to a coach that I know and I've now got as part of my network. Look, this is the decision I made. This is what their thoughts were. What would you be like in that instance? And you can have some some rich conversations about it. Um, so I think, yeah, one probably developing that network of people is really important as part of your own development. And then the bit that I would really align to that is, I, I don't think you can ever stop learning. Um, and I, I know loads of people say it, but absolutely, you've got to be doing 
different types of courses, um, not just in football. I think, you know, you've got to probably broaden your mindset as well a, a little bit. Um, I was talking to someone earlier about the top, top sporting directors in the game are probably the broadest systemic thinkers you could ever imagine. You know, I, I touched on on Brighton making that decision to go and sign a player from Argentina. Well, actually, you know, in terms of the performance data around that player, you could probably match them up with a lot of people around the world. You know, as a, as a young person, you go, right, okay, well, however, there's probably a real opportunity to take someone from Argentina. So it might be more than just the performance piece of signing that player. Okay, we can get some real economic value by going into Argentina and taking a player. That might create a pathway for future players to come from there because we know that they're, uh, you know, the spiral for the economy is going down. So that might create a some future generations it might increase our fan base in uh in in south america because we've already gone and signed a player from ecuador or whatever it may be that there, there'll probably be some broader understanding of why you've made decisions to sign certain players um so i think yeah being having that that mindset to be able to do that is really important and that comes from educating yourself i think um and whether that's in a formal setting um or it might be something you know informal where you watch something on TV or you read a book or um, you go and read a broadsheet newspaper, the Telegraph, the Times and understand the financial markets and how that's going to affect the world globally. Um, I think having that, I think, is 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 really important. And one of the, one of the probably the, the issues that we have around development of individuals is you can get pulled into a, a, a bubble um and go right this is the world that i operate in and you you sort of stay there and i know all my qualifications are are football based or um the only language that i speak is 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 english um the only culture that i understand is the the english academy system and what that looks like so i think actually growing and developing yourself i think you've got to you know you've got to be systemic in your thoughts about that as well <laughs> So I think, uh, yeah, I think that's really important. You mentioned growing markets and you mentioned coming out your comfort zone. You mentioned English academies and obviously the experience of, of exploring other cultures and other areas. Obviously, where you're positioned now in the Middle East, how would you see that development going in terms of its growing market and potential to develop football players leagues etc i'm just interested in what you think how that will fare for you obviously working out there yeah so the middle east really really interesting at the moment um and i think obviously the spotlight is shining on saudi arabia um now what's what's really interesting about saudi is everyone sees obviously it in the context of of football um and yes there's like some huge transfer fees taking place uh some huge transfers taking place with big fees attached to it and big salaries attached to it as well. Um, I think one of the one of the uh, things that will be a success criteria or something that will really contribute to the success of football in Saudi Arabia is the, the 2030 plan around sport. So it's not just football. There's actually some bigger investment levels that are going into other sports um, that, that are there. So what, what what's happening is, is the, the Saudi Pro League is not traveling alone. Uh, and the Saudi uh, Football Association is not traveling alone. Actually, they're creating this 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 whole community of sport so that, um, one, that, look, they've got 60 million people. So if you can engage 60 million people in sport, um, you, you're going to start really, really developing the talent pools um, within, within, uh, within football and with other sports and developing athletes. So actually, I think Saudi will be a, a really big success. There's a huge in investment level there. Um, so Saudi, from a football perspective, I think will be really successful. Um, they've got some really interesting um, ownership models there. Uh, obviously, you've got the private investment fund. Um, you've got a, a new fund that's been created for the additional clubs in, in the Pro League. Pro League. You've got some centralized decision-making processes that come from with within the Saudi Pro League. Um, but what you've also got is the Saudi Pro League and the um, the Saudi FA working really closely together. So actually, you've, 
you've formed some partnerships. There's a real understanding within the whole region of the Middle East, um, and particularly from from Saudi, the UAE, Qatar, um, probably some of the leading nations in that in that region, where actually you can't do something independently. You actually need to drag the others along with you. So when if you look at if you look at the success of your European national teams in the World Cup, you know they're they're, they're dominating the World Cup, and the same in South America. You know if you get in the latter stages of World Cup, South American teams are there as well. And it's not it's not because you've got one dominant nation. So actually, Saudi being on its own wouldn't wouldn't work. What you've got is actually a number of nations that are now investing in sport um, and leveraging off probably that investment from Saudi Arabia, where they're going oh, okay. Well, this is going to raise the TV revenue for the Champions League in the AFC Champions League. Um, so, actually, how do we reinvest that to make sure that we've got a sustainable workforce in in the UAE and we get really successful national teams so that the Champions League becomes really competitive? Um, because people want to watch the best players in the world, so they'll naturally pay to watch the AFC Champions League and some of those Saudi teams and Cristiano Cristiano Ronaldo and Benzema. And, you know, people want to watch those people. Um, so I think there's some real opportunities across the whole of the region. Uh, so not just the Middle East, probably AFC is a, a sort of broader context. So certainly Japan and Australia, I'm sure, are, um, are looking at it and going, right, there's some opportunities for, he- for us here um, to really leverage off um, what's happening in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, so I think it's exciting times. Um, you've almost got, you've got some blank sheets of paper in some of the Middle East countries. Um, where you're going, okay, well, we probably can't challenge Saudi Arabia in terms of the level of investment into football and also having that full context of sport being included. But okay, well, how do we leverage off it then? What are the things that we can do? So uh, in the UAE Pro League, for example, they've done it slightly differently where we're looking at it going, right, well, we need to make sure the infrastructure of the clubs um, in terms of, right, have we got sporting directors? Have we got academy directors? Do we have all of the key high performance staff that are required in, um, in in the club environment? Do we make sure we've got strategic plans in place for clubs that are actually lived by? There's a support mechanism in place from the UAE Pro League to be able to support clubs to make sure that decision making processes are really good for the development of young players. Because actually, our league might feed Saudi Arabia. It might be a really good opportunity because we'll have some people that will speak Arabic. They'll be used to living in the region. So actually, you, you become one of the main contributors to something that's happening in another part of your of your region. Um, so, um, yeah, I think hugely, hugely exciting place to be. Um, some some big challenges, with, without a doubt, with some big challenges. Hierarchies look different. Leadership looks different in in, in this region to what we would be used to in in, in Europe. Um, but. Um, I generally think they're in a really good place to, to to move it forward. And in terms of that success, then are we looking at maybe the Saudi Pro League or the the, the UA uh, the UAE Pro League, as well as maybe the, the other countries you mentioned? You mentioned Qatar. Uh, in terms of competing with the top leagues of, in Europe, is is that kind of the ambition of of this use of of the welfare fund and, and pumping this into into sport and creating something? That it's, it's global. Where where do we see success? What is defined? As yeah, so I, I think um, what what's what's hugely interesting. So I think in, if, you, if we talk about football in in England, we'd probably talk about it a little bit in isolation and just go, "Yeah, hey, look, you know, we lo- we love football, and it's something we we go to on a Saturday or we go to on a Tuesday night." And what's really interesting with um, with Saudi and UAE and Qatar, and they're actually seeing the benefits of sport in a social context as well. So how does that contribute to the whole system in in these countries? So I talked about being a systemic thinker, that they've, they've certainly thought systemically. So obviously the, um, the tourism funds that are then linked to specific football clubs for attracting visitors to your region um, for leisure and uh tourism spend um i i think they've they've really thought broadly about that um so it actually has a bigger impact than just the actual sport piece in terms of that where we're talking about right well what does performance success looks like i certainly think um they're looking at it going right well there's an opportunity to 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 challenge europe and to 
challenge South America. Um, I think it will take quite a number of years from a player development perspective. So actually we're, cr- we're developing young players that are capable on the top tier stage in, in, in world football. I think that's going to be a real a real challenge, but it would come eventually if obviously we maintain this momentum. Um, but certainly I think in terms of the models that exist at the moment, um, how they're recruiting players and some of the strategic plans that we have in place for for football in the in the region, um, they're certainly heading in the certainly heading in the right direction to be able to do that and uh, and, and, and go and challenge world football. Um, so yeah, well, one thing I would say, and this is personal perception, I'm all for uh, football to be more global. Uh, I know there's a lot of negativity towards Saudi Arabia at the moment. Obviously, the transfer fees and everything that's associated within the in the news of human rights, etc. But one thing that I did think is can the cultural aspect of atmosphere and the entertainment that you see within a football game in the the Champions League at Anfield or Celtic Park or all those other famous British clubs as well as European clubs, can that be replicated? And I don't think it can. I don't think you can buy that. And I'm interested on how Saudi accommodate that. And I know obviously in the World Cup when they beat Argentina, it was a fantastic atmosphere and they had a fantastic fan base, Saudi Arabia. But that was the World Cup, do you know? And there's a lot of stuff in the news around, you know, attendance is very low. Um, and, and and that kind of replication of the European model in terms of fan base, etc. I, I, I'm not sure if it, it can be replicated. It's interesting what you think on that in terms of a fandom perspective. Joe, you know, it's interesting. I went back, I came back to the UK in uh, sort of October, November time. And um, um I went to uh, I went to uh, watch Grimsby play in the FA Youth Cup away at Shrewsbury, and um, obviously you've got a handful of supporters in one sort of stands, and the rest of the ground's empty. And I, but I walked in, and it just smelt right and felt right, and there was something different about it that was really engaging for me. Now whether that's because I've grown up in that environment and there's that yeah there's that emotional attachment to to that I don't know uh, you know you. you you understand the banter that's going on with some of the fans. And um, so, and I, I've thought about this. So I was like, yeah, we'd never replicate that. What does that look like? However, if you're a fan growing up in that particular country and, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, how you go to the game with your dads, what that looks like as a, as a, as a young Emirati or a young Saudi going to a game and spending good quality time with you know your siblings and um calling out to your favorite but I, I think they get that emotional attachment so i think the atmosphere will look different and if we or if you went to a game you'd probably go yeah but we haven't got that atmosphere now it does that to them probably doesn't matter because actually the atmosphere that they've captured is for the people that exist in in their country and what they love and uh certainly we know that Saudi can attract fans to game. One of the big challenges we see with us here is we don't have that culture. We want to attract people to the game. So it's how do we do how do we do that piece? But I think that emotional attachment to what you're comfortable with and what you like, I think would be the same. I think they would probably go to England and go, Yeah, it was great and I enjoyed the environment, but like oh, I love this because this is my club and those are my players and I think I think you get the same emotional attachment to um to a club, which I think is important, the club piece. How do you get someone emotionally attached to a club? Because a lot of people at the moment across the Middle East, their number one club is a club in the UK or or uh, or a Real Madrid or a Juventus or, right, how do we get them attached to that local club? And I think that will come, um, but it, it, it needs to become historic. So, right, have we now been doing this for 20 years and have now become emotionally attached to that club and I'm now taking my kids to the game and it, it probably feels something a little bit more now because I, I love the club and my, my children will feel what I'm feeling because they'll see my emotional state in the game. I think it can be great, but I think it'll take a number of years. So to, just on that then, so you mentioned it might take a number of years. Obviously, the vision 2030 is kind of the, the outlook towards the whole redevelopment of Saudi and, and the Middle East. How long do you think this will take to, to get to those levels? As mentioned, you, you, you've obviously seen the... the um, the, the purchase of players, high transfer fees, and the uh, the appeal to go uh, to Saudi due to 
salaries and etc and all everything that, that that's associated with it at the moment but in terms of time frame are we talking 20 years 30 years or are we talking 2030 I'm, I'm interested on where you see it, it will grow into fruition if, if that makes sense yeah i think um i think they've, they've got a bit of a golden ticket because 2034 they've got the world cup um so that that brings a certain level of um acceleration to the process because all of a sudden you'll have people from all over the globe traveling there that will probably influence those environments and you'll get young people that will probably get emotionally attached to that competition and wanting to go to football um and then there'll be a four-year legacy from from fifa within that region to support uh coach education player development education of young people using football as a as a tool to drive some other key projects and challenges in that region. Um, so you'll probably get an accelerated, um, uh, an acceleration of the situation there. So I, I would certainly think the World Cup will certainly be a big contributor to that and also things like the Club World Cup contributing to that in, in, in Saudi. Um, so I think if, if you hadn't got that, you're probably looking at about a 20-year projection. Um, however, we, we might, might now be looking at 10 to 10 to 14 years with that 2034 World Cup and the uh, and, and the legacy program on top of it as well. Uh, and what about women's football then, Gareth? Is there much that you are aware of from from that perspective and that lens? Obviously, you know, historically in these countries, you know, women's rights haven't been at its best. Is that perception changing towards? That and obviously seeing football as a tool to maybe accommodate maybe some of the issues that have happened within society as a kind of a microcosm of reflecting that within yeah. football. I'm interested in how you think that will grow. Yeah, I think that it will probably be one of the real sort of important things that comes out of the World Cup coming to Saudi, and I'm I'm sure it will be a, a key um, reflection piece for FIFA around right. How can we affect society in in Saudi Arabia? Um, and some of the social challenges in Saudi Arabia based on us having the biggest tournament in the world there. So actually, can we really challenge um, the government and the community on certain areas because we're actually contributing to, their, to, the, to the future of the, of the country? Um, I think there's a real opportunity there, but that needs to be taken 100%. It, it needs to be... Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely not one of these people that would say, right, we can't go to Saudi because some of the things that happened I definitely look at it almost in a positive context. I get why people would not want it there, hundred percent. But I'm like, right, well, let's almost reverse that. Let's sort of yeah. say, right, well, how can we impact some of the challenges that we've got in Saudi Arabia? How how can we use football as a, a force for good in in that particular area? Uh, and just in terms of the, the sort of female game, um, it's I, I find it sort of quite interesting. So we're very sort of immature in the female game in the UAE. Um, so it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, we need to start looking at the professional game and how it can be developed in, in, in this country. Um, but almost the reverse in terms of uh, the culture around females in the UAE are very respected. Um, they're held quite highly in terms of society. Um, they have certain privileges within the UAE. Um, so probably even further than sort of the Western, the Western world. Um, but obviously, we get then get the reverse of that in in, in Saudi Arabia, where um, you know people are being challenged around: Are they allowed to drive? Can they attend certain educational institutions? Um, how they're treated in the household deemed acceptable um, in terms of culturally? Um, so, yet they have a, a professional league that really looks like it's um, taking some real effect and there's some real growth models there um now whether young females in saudi are starting to recognize that actually being involved in sport and being involved in football you know they they could be a an advocate for changing their country for younger siblings or for their own children when they come through but they certainly have really seems to have grasped football over there with 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 two hands um and you can obviously even from a an international perspective um they've really had a uh a focus as a as a league and as an fa around the female game um and and 
to be honest. They've almost put the whole performance jigsaw together to go, right, we can't just do it in the men's game. This can't be... Actually, yeah, we need to... I don't... It's not a tick box exercise for them. I think they've genuinely said, no, this is the right thing to do and it will contribute to the whole ecosystem of football in Saudi Arabia. And I really hope that has a whole... That has an effect across the whole of the Middle East as well because I think there's a great opportunity in the female game to... Um, Look, it's accelerating tenfold every year um, and it probably needs huge level of investment to, to continue. Um, there's some unbelievable practitioners in, in, in the female game um, and we need to give them access to the whole game. Um, and to do that, we need to keep growing female football. And, and if what's happening in terms of the growth of the professional game in Saudi can um, be replicated across the Middle East, I think we're, I think we're in a really sort of fortunate position. What does the future hold for you then, Gareth? Obviously, being out in the Middle East, UAE, and the potential for growth. You mentioned, uh, obviously, opportunities that might be apparent in the surrounding areas. But what does it look like for you in terms of your role and how you might see yourself uh, in the future in terms of how this might play out? What, 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 look, what does the, the future hold for you? <laughs> I think, um, you know, if I can really try and influence change in... Um, in in the UAE um, around what does the professional game look like? How can we how can we grow the game so it's um, it, it influences young players to want to come and come into football, whether that be from a just a grassroots perspective or a pastime in the game, or to be a fan and be able to take your children or your children's children. Um, I think being able to contribute to that is something that I'm really conscious of and can I be influential in that um, is, is is really important to me. Um, so within that's in the f- sort of full-time context of, of my role. Um, obviously, I'm involved in a really exciting project at, at Grimsby. Um, we've got unbelievable owners, an unbelievable CEO that we, we actually lose next month to the EFL, but um, we've got a great coach that's just come in and, um, but a, a really exciting project in terms of where they want to take the club to. Um, things like that really excite me. I love I love that aspect of being involved with them as a club. Um, so I, I want to continue with that um, without a doubt. Um, so yeah, I, look, I want to continue to grow and develop and I, I really like sort of different types of experiences. Um, I would be lying if I didn't say I wasn't interested in that in the multi-club ownership group models. Um, I, I get to speak to a lot of people on a sort of daily basis that are involved in those groups or I get the opportunity to advise on with some of those groups. Um, that that really interests me. So certainly something I'd pr- probably like to be involved in in the future. Um, but um, yeah, I, look, I've just I've just finished a master's in international sports law. Um, I've, I've been learning Arabic. Um, I actually had a Portuguese lesson today. Um, uh, we, you know, we've got a lot of um, players from South America that, that right. come here. My Spanish is okay, um, but um, actually learning Portuguese will probably be the next the next language to master. And I need to build on my on my Arabic as well. Um, but then, probably one of the biggest challenges is trying to stay connected to the European game and the South American game. How do you do that? Um, that's really difficult when you're out of the country. Um, you know, you want to stay connected to your network that you've built at, at home as well. Um, so just making sure I'm involved in different types of projects. So you know, I'm on the committee at the Association of Sporting Directors and working with the FAW as a, a technical advisor. Um, you know, those are, are really important things to me. And um, from a one, I, I really enjoy the work. But two, I think it it's probably part of my sort of non-formal education as well. It keeps me up to date with some of the modern trends that are coming out through the game. Uh, and, and, and keeps keeps me current and hopefully some of that can influence the work that I'm doing here there might be something that I can go and pitch from, from over there and and, and, and use here and, and vice versa if there's things that, that we, do, we do because we've got a blank sheet of paper and we can come out with different types of ideas around how we work if I can then try and take that back and share it with someone in, in the game in England um, you know that's that's just beneficial I think for the whole ecosystem of football Excellent Gareth and very impressive as well in terms of learning multiple languages and, and seeing the effective nature of communication. Um, interesting how that 
will be an asset for you going forward, especially when we mentioned throughout the podcast how global sport is becoming. My final question to you then, Gareth, is how would you like to be remembered? If you reflect back on obviously your your time within the game, playing, um, all these different roles that you've had over the course of your journey and the day comes where you put where you put your feet up and you you, you want to chill out and, and kind of see uh the remainder of your years chilling out maybe in in the middle east wherever it is that you are how how would you be how would you like to be remembered is there anything that you think is important to you in terms of your values yeah i think i think as long as you know the people that i've worked with and um been part of their development journey or they've been part of mine hopefully they just sort of see me as a good person uh, i think that's that's really important i think that the the jobs you get and the roles that you go and play um will probably tell you if you're doing a good job um you know and other people will want you to go into certain roles and but being a good person is the most important thing um can like the game can be absolutely brutal um and it's you know it's challenging to be in high performance environments but 100 percent, you've got to be you've got to be a good person we all know what's right and wrong we all know how to treat people um so that for me if someone remembers me as that or if people talk about me like that that's great for me. Excellent, Gareth. Just want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Obviously, your experiences and what you've uh, expressed throughout our conversation has been very uh, inspiring. Hopefully, that continues without within your role in the Middle East and obviously with Grimsby. I actually have friends that are big Grimsby Town fans. They had a big FA Cup run last year, so I've always kept an eye out for Grimsby. And hopefully, you know that continues to be successful for you. So, just want to say, like again, thank you, uh, and good luck in the future. No, well, thank you, Christy. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure to come and come and speak to you. I really hope your friends weren't expecting another cup run this year. With this <laughs> the board, uh, but uh, if they can, uh, if they can just 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 hold on, um, I think we've got some exciting times coming uh, coming their way. So uh, yeah, it'd be good to see you uh, see you down at Grimsby uh, uh, at some point. <laughs>